Today on Growing Boulder, preserving the stories and the first-hand accounts from some of America's bravest veterans, the men who fought enemies at home and overseas, the Tuskegee Airmen. What did you learn about life from being in three wars? <laughs> How to survive. The message that this American hero has for anyone wondering what Growing Boulder is all about. And it's a victory lap for dreamers everywhere. How our very own medical director is rebranding aging and proving it's not about age, it's about attitude. Now on Growing Boulder. What's most important to you? What really matters? Remember when you thought the future was filled with limitless possibility? It still is. Dreams don't have an expiration date. It's not too late to find your purpose, to live with passion, to make an impact in the lives of others and in the world we live in. Stop growing older and start growing bolder. Support for Growing Bolder provided by Hi, I'm Mark Middleton, and this is Growing Boulder. Dr. Robert Masson is the Growing Boulder Medical Director. His full-time job is as a spine surgeon. In fact, he's one of the most innovative and renowned minimally invasive microsurgeons in the world. We share a philosophy of life with Dr. Masson that's based on several key principles, including one that we're all capable of far more than we know, and it's never too late to develop and expand those capabilities. That's absolutely extraordinary restart. Dr. Massan's latest demonstration of those facts is his meteoric rise in motorsports. Less than four years after climbing into a race car for the very first time, he reached the highest level of professional sports car racing. Driving on the same team with his son Kyle against the biggest names in racing, the Massans finished second in the Rolex 24 at Daytona International Speedway. So how did he get to the Rolex 24 at Daytona so quickly at his age? How did he end up in the same car as his son Kyle? How did the Massans become one of the biggest stories in motorsports? It's a story of passion and persistence that's straight from the Growing Boulder playbook. As Growing Boulder Medical Director Dr. Robert Massan walks through the garage area at Daytona International Speedway, he can't help but remember walking through the garage at Sebring International Raceway last year, the day he nervously made his racing debut, realizing a childhood dream. So this is my first year in IMSA, which is the largest North American road racing organization. My son was the rookie last year, his dad's the rookie this year, and uh, it's a little overwhelming, but I'm having a great time. Much has changed in the past year, including Dr. Masson's definition of success. Unfortunately, last year I had zero expectations. Now I have expectations. I have an agenda. I know exactly what I want to accomplish. Results are more important to me than they were a year ago. I want to end up on the podium, the overall podium. That's our goal, very specifically. After a seventh place finish in his debut race at Sebring last year, Dr. Masson steadily improved over the course of the season. Dr. Masson is driving quite differently this weekend than we've seen before. All of a sudden, he's got this figured out. It's like something has clicked. Robert's late season charge propelled him to a second place finish in the Masters Division Season Championship. His son Kyle dominated the overall series, winning 11 of 13 races while simultaneously competing in WeatherTech's Tequila Patron North American Endurance Championship where he won three of four races, including the Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona and the 12 Hours of Sebring. All told, he took the checkered flag in 14 of 17 races, winning two championships. This year, Kyle is competing full-time in WeatherTech's highest prototype class, so Robert is racing for the first time without him in the field and in the same garage. I didn't realize how much I depended on him for all the little details about performance and setup and 
coaching and lots of little things. And uh, it's pretty cool to be able to depend on your 20 year old kid. Today's race is the first ever IMSA prototype challenge presented by Mazda at Daytona International Speedway, the world center of racing. And it draws a large crowd anxious to meet the drivers, get their autographs, and even see their cars up close. It's living a dream. It's definitely something I never saw myself doing. I'm really eager to be able to inspire those smiles. It's a different animal for me completely, and I love it. As much as your patients love you, how many of your patients have asked for your autograph? Zero. Well, unless you count prescriptions, right? So, uh, but never, never for real. So that was cool. Dr. Massan qualifies third in the MPC, which starts behind the higher powered and faster LMP3s. Robert almost immediately moves into the MPC lead with a pass of performance tech teammate Wyatt Schwab. Schwab reclaims the lead a short time later, but when he hits debris on the track, Masson takes over and never looks back. With his family, including Kyle, watching from the pits, Masson dominates the race, taking his first ever checkered flag, winning not only the Masters division, but the entire MPC class by over 12 seconds. Dr. Masson, first win in the series. Nice job, Robert. How's that feel, buddy? Now, I was worried a little bit, you know, after an hour, an hour and 10 minutes, if the old guy had the endurance. Well, you know, they worry about our hearts and all these things, but, uh, you know, I think some of my fastest laps were in the last 20 minutes. So, uh, I, I, you know, we can do it. One of the hardest places in the world to put your car is in Victory Lane at Daytona. As Dr. Masson's car is rolled in and he raises his trophy atop the podium, a unique moment unfolds that few here are aware of, a first of its kind intergenerational connection from one year to the next. One year ago, you were in Victory Lane with Kyle. Yeah. Did you ever imagine you'd be the guy? Yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought that. I'm in Victory Lane at Daytona a year after Kyle won the Rolex 24. That's phenomenal. Incredible. It's an incredible moment for Dr. Robert Masson and an important moment for all of motorsports. Racing is a dream that countless boys and girls grow up with, and thanks to IMSA and the example of drivers like Robert and Kyle Masson, it's a dream that's never too soon or too late to pursue. And it's a proud moment for growing bolder when one of our own, through hard work, dedication, and the pursuit of relentless forward progress, inspires all of us to dream big. For all those people who will ultimately watch this and uh, who are paying attention to what I'm trying to do on behalf of Growing Boulder, I really hope that they use it in some small way to uh, leap forward to some personal goal, whether it be athletic or emotional or political or uh, philosophical, it doesn't matter. And it's amazing what committing to a journey will give you. And it's the Growing Boulder way, it's the say yes attitude. And, I really, really hope that if they see this, that will flip a switch for them personally, that they can hit their next dream, because that's what you guys are all about, and that's why I love being part of it. Kyle learned to race before he had a driver's license. Robert learned to race before he qualified for Medicare. Their story transcends motorsports and proves that growing bolder is not about age, it's about attitude. So what's Dr. Masson's attitude now? He wants to be in Victory Lane at the same time as Kyle. My new goal is now, well, he moved up to the highest class in racing, and now I'm an anchor to him, so I have to get better so that I can move up to the highest, so I can race with my kid again. And, you know, if I fall short, at least I tried, but that is my new goal, is to get to the highest level of uh, prototype racing in North America. That's growing bolder. And as we now know, that's a goal he accomplished just 12 months later. You know, there is so much we can learn from Dr. Masson and his success. It didn't happen by accident. He prepared for it physically and then executed a strategic plan based upon goal setting. He says both points are something we should all incorporate into our own lives. No matter what, this vessel of ours has to be preserved, it has to be protected, so that no matter what our joy or our passion is, if you neglect it, 
it's going to affect your ability to enjoy your passions as you age. When I really started committing myself to the racing with Kyle, which was the motivation at first, I realized, wow, uh, this is the first time since really uh, college that I, I, I remember what it's like to have specific goals, obsessive uh, performance metrics, and uh, it improved my work life, it improved sleep, it improved energy management, it improved the way I eat, uh, the, the toxins I bring into my body societally. Every quality of, uh, of better health was brought to me because I had this new goal. And uh, I love that. And, and I, so I use it as a reminder now to, to, to really send the message that, look, it's, it's not too late to start organized goals. I think all of us are better off if we put some sort of organized goal out there. It doesn't have to be professional racing, but anything that gives you structure, that gives you habit, that gives you purpose, that makes you feel better about yourself and gives you optimism and hope going forward is going to improve your health. And, uh, and this was that for me. Well, there are a lot of tough lessons learned from war. One of the most important and inspiring from World War II came from the Tuskegee Airmen, not just because they served with distinction, but because they helped a lot of people to see racism at home for what it was. Because inside the cockpit of a fighter plane, you don't see color. What you do see is skill, patriotism, and courage. And all these years later, that's still something to celebrate. They gathered to celebrate one of the most unique people in the community, a man who's been making a difference for 95 years. Richard Hall has seen the world, all of its wonders and three of its wars. He's faced formidable enemies overseas, but also at home. Hall is a Tuskegee Airman, one of the last alive. I'm proud I'm still around to tell so <laughs> yeah the story begins with the very purpose the Tuskegee Institute was founded on July 4th 1881 by Booker T Washington he lifted the veil of ignorance from his people and pointed the way to progress through education and industry <laughs> When World War II began, the Army decided to build an airstrip there and do what was unthinkable at the time, to train African Americans to join the fight. More than trees had to be cleared away. There was misunderstanding and distrust and prejudice to be cleared away. It wasn't easy. Many were mistreated, disrespected, and resented. But they stood their ground to prove their character, their ability, and their patriotism. I think we're inspired by Colonel Davis, Benton O. Davis. Now he went to West Point, and he said that uh, then he's in a room by himself. He ate in the dining hall by himself. And you know what? He said that he had plenty of time to study. <laughs> now, yeah. he spent his time in the library and studied. And he said after the second year at West Point, the white guys were asking him for information. <laughs> so Hall also studied and became a distinguished mechanic. He knew the P-25 and the P-40 as well as anyone. In fact, the men trained at Tuskegee were so accomplished, everyone began to take notice. Here for the first time, Negro aviation cadets were being groomed to fly war planes of a unit which was then a unit and fought only, the 99th Pursuit Squadron. These men were pioneers of a venture so new that you who stand here before me now, after three years, may still be considered forerunners in the movement which has given you a place in the fighting men of the sky. Hall says he knew he was fighting for freedom, abroad and at home, but personally his goal was simple. I was just trying to survive <laughs> because I figured that I'd go back to college after I got, that's what I had in mind. But you didn't. You chose to stay in the service. Yeah. Why did you, why did you do that? Well, I had a brother in college. Then I had a sister who came up with a born while overseas. Mom and dad's getting rid of age. And I was the only one who had an income. Both of my brothers were So you college. stayed in the service to support, support my family. family. 
And the next thing you know, you're in Korea fighting another war. Uh -huh. And you wind up in a B-25 manning a gun. No, oh, and 25. And the missions, you, you didn't just do a few. <laughs> Every other day. Every other day. Yeah. Did you have close calls? Oh, yeah, I had a lot of close calls. Well, I said. <laughs> what was it like to not know if today was going to be your last day? You don't think about it. If you thought about it, you'd go nuts. <laughs> yeah. And you keep your mind busy. And send it out for hours, and your mind stays busy because you fly every other day. You got to spend the day, you're not flying, getting the gear together. Things you need, be sure your airplanes in good operation. What did you learn about life from being in three wars? <laughs> How to survive. <laughs> no. Did it change you? How did it change you? It made me old. <laughs> yeah. Upstairs and my body. <laughs> but what was it that you think that you were looking for? Was it respect? Yeah, respect like everybody else. And do you think you ended up getting it? We got some, I think. Yeah. Because our society has changed since the 20s or 30s. You know. Have we come far enough? Not far enough, no. And you, this little kid from this country town in Florida, <laughs> became a chief master sergeant yeah. in the United States Air Force. A yeah. 30 year distinguished career. What was the highest award that you were given? Just recently. The Congressional Gold Medal. The Congressional Gold Medal from George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. What did that mean to you? Quite a bit. I was wondering why it waited so long to give it to us. <laughs> okay, he needs some help, y'all. Okay. We got some help. Are you pretty proud? Yeah, I'm pretty, very proud. Hmm? You lived a good life. Yeah. So far. You, so far. <laughs> you, got more, you got more of your story to write, don't you? I said at least 100. <laughs> and that's your goal, right? Make it to 100. At least. At least. Always say at least. At least. If I go 101, I would put, turn it down. <laughs> and you want to stick around because there are more people that want to hear your story. No. There are more people that want to shake the hand of a man who flew in the face of adversity. Yeah and set an example for, for the rest of the country to follow. That's a pretty good life. Yes, very thankful. Well, he sure is someone who's learned to look at the positive side of every part of his life, even at 95. Some takeaways, take some time to really think about your own life story. Everybody has an interesting one. What can we learn from what you've been through? Number two, tell it to family, friends, anybody. You never know who might be inspired by what you've been through. Third, make sure you keep looking ahead. Did you catch where he says he's lived a pretty good life so far? Well, that's a pretty good attitude. There are now about 35 million caregivers in the U.S. who provide unpaid care for someone age 50 or older. And unfortunately, this is a need that will only grow in the decades ahead. Caring for an aging loved one involves a never-ending series of sometimes difficult decisions. We asked caregiving expert Amy O'Rourke if she ever recommends removing a loved one from the health care system. Yes. And it's, it's delicate because the healthcare system is designed to fix and treat and cure. That's, that's what healthcare systems do. And when you're 90 or 92 or 95 or even 88, or even if it's just not your wishes and you don't want all that, we don't have a good alternative place for them to go yet. But I know we'll get there and we need to get there. The first thing I would say is if you end up in the hospital or if your parent ends up in the hospital, slow everything down. If you get if you get pushed to make a decision, you know, we have to do this test or we have to take this x-ray or we have to do the swallow study or we have to take them down for an MRI, just slow it down. Say, let me, let me just take a few minutes and think about this. Let me talk to my siblings. Let me talk to my parents and buy some time because sometimes in the busyness of getting all the treatment you just end up swept up in the moment of all those tests and then the second thing I would do is say 
as a result, if we find something, find a medical problem as a result of this test or this x-ray, are we gonna do the thing that they recommend we do? And if you're not, then do you need the test? If the end result is gonna be a surgery that my parent doesn't want, I don't want the test. There's a lot of talk these days about chronic inflammation, which is a key factor in aging. It's a proven risk factor in a broad range of age-related diseases, including hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, cancer, gout, Alzheimer's, and more. One of the primary causes of chronic inflammation is diet. So what can we eat and what should we avoid eating to reduce chronic inflammation? Here's nationally renowned dietitian and nutrition consultant, Tara Collingwood. Did you know that all disease and pain starts with inflammation somewhere in your body? I've got some all natural ways to reduce inflammation on a daily basis just by what you're eating. So let's start with tart cherries. Numerous studies have shown that drinking tart cherry juice can reduce inflammation and swelling, especially in people with osteoarthritis. Now how about turmeric? Turmeric also has powerful anti-inflammatory effects as well as being a strong antioxidant due to the curcumin, which is the active ingredient in the turmeric. And you've no doubt heard about the power of omega-3s. DHA and EPA are the main omega-3s that have been linked to reducing inflammation in the body and helping with various diseases from asthma to migraine to Alzheimer's and arthritis. Eat foods like salmon, walnuts, or chia seeds, or you can take a fish oil pill. And eat those fruits and veggies. As a category, fruits and veggies are high in antioxidants, which help to reduce damage from free radicals, which in turn helps to prevent inflammation. Now you know how you can eat the pain away. The importance of diet as we age can't be overstated. The bad news is that unhealthy food can become addicting, literally. The good news is once we begin eliminating toxic food from our diet, the health benefits begin to appear almost immediately. Our mood improves, we feel better, have more energy, and become sick less often. Get more great tips from Tara and our other Growing Boulder contributing experts at growingbolder.com slash TV. Hi, I'm Cecily Wilson. You know, I believe that it's never too late to pursue your passion, and part of Growing Boulder is shining the spotlight on the men and women who lead by example. One of those people goes by Grandma Mary, and let me tell you, she rocks. At 77, Mary is a global internet sensation. She plays the guitar and has fans of all ages who love her incredible energy and spirit. As a kid, Mary had wanted to try and learn to play, but life kind of got in the way. Finally, she decided to face her fears and go after her goal. At the age of 60 plus, I started to play the guitar. When my grandchildren came, I didn't have the time. So when they grow up, I bought a guitar and entertained myself. The first time I heard Santana, I fell in love with Samba Pati. I started to look for a teacher. He looked at me, he said, I don't know how to teach you. Besides, Santana is up there and you're just crawling. He said, you have to go through a lot before you can play the blues. I feel the blues, I can feel with my heart and soul. I know what life is like. You need a lot of practice. Without practice, you know, there's no shortcut. Mary is right, there is no shortcut. But when you believe in your dreams, you can achieve anything. And she's even met some of the people that most inspired her, including Santana. She's been on television, performed across Singapore, and teamed up with Samsung for an international commercial campaign. Mary inspires everyone around her and has even used her skills to give back, performing, and raising awareness for charities. Mary is growing bolder. Are you? Never forget that what the mind believes, the body embraces. Our psychological health drives our physiological health. We anticipate the perceived negative benchmarks of growing older so powerfully that we almost guarantee they'll come to pass. And the result is devastating on both a personal and a societal level. We're literally killing ourselves with our belief systems, robbing ourselves not only of years of life, but quality of life. And we're adding billions of dollars to our national health care cost. Life is about learning, 
And the last great task is learning how to grow older. Growing bolder isn't about changing what is, it's about finding the power and the possibility in what is. How do I define successful aging? Never stop growing. More specifically, never stop growing bolder. Close your eyes and imagine someone who is 60, 80, or even 100. Now imagine more, a lot more. Now go make it happen. We'll see you next time. Support for Growing Bolder provided by More information about all of the stories you've seen here today is available at growingbolder.com slash TV. And you can get inspired to keep rebranding aging when you connect with the Growing Boulder community on Facebook. Growing Boulder Apparel is available for $25 plus shipping and handling. A companion book, Growing Boulder, Defy the Cult of Youth, Live with Passion and Purpose by Mark Middleton is available as well for $25 plus shipping and handling. And you can subscribe to Growing Boulder Magazine, four quarterly issues for $29.97 a year. Order online at growingbolder.com slash TV.